This is Barry Jackson, and I'm talking with violinist extraordinaire, composer, producer. He's done TV and movies, and we're going to get into quite a bit, quite a bit about what his what he's done with his career and what he plans, what he's doing now, and what he plans to do in the future. Mr. Noah Webb. Hi, hi, Barry. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your origins, how, how you got started uh, with with the violin, and 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 what have you. My mother was a graduate of Juilliard as a pianist, and uh, I had music throughout my family, so she, right away, there was music all over my house. At five years old, I was playing the piano pretty, pretty fairly, and at ten years old, I came running home from school saying I wanted to play the violin. I have no idea why, but I was, it, it was the, the base of my spine to do this. And then at 14, I was in the Boston uh, Symphony Orchestra organization as a kind of a prodigy player all over New England, traveling the world, playing with symphonies. And then at 17, I really ignored rock, uh, except maybe the Beatles, I suppose. And then at uh, 17, 18, I got turned on to uh, uh, Coltrane and began playing with people who used to play with Coltrane, uh, Marion Brown and Mills and some of the players. And uh, and there was a classical writer named Penderek. He would write way out outside. He wrote read, wrote the uh, Trinity of Hiroshima, and it opened me up. And with uh, Coltrane people, we played atonal with no keys, absolutely no keys at all. Try doing that for two years, and uh, you will really open your music up. So, mm-hmm. And then met John Hammond and played a lot of blues and uh, the tubes and the Allman Brothers and all sorts of good stuff. Country, rock, jazz, wide open. Anybody who could play, I could play with, I played. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, at what point did you, what point did you finally decide that this was going to be your career? Um, just in case I missed something there. Ah, well, it's funny you ask that. Um, I, maybe it was when I ran home at ten years old, but uh, I went to Bowdoin College in Maine. I have a degree in the political science and his, in history in uh, from that college. And uh, because when I was in high school, I had uh, my body, the right side of my body was crushed in sports. And so for about a year, I couldn't play the violin. Mm. And I went on and decided to do academics. Uh, and uh, But when I met Marion, and I started playing, really when I played the blues, the blues for me hit home very deeply for me. Uh, just simple, very simple stuff. Jamie Abersold. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. gr- you know, he, he had books out and tapes out, and when I and, and I knew that what you had to do was to copy. You had to begin improvising by copying people, and I did that with the blues and got lines and jazz lines together, and then I went on my own way, and right then I knew this is what I would do for the rest of my life. And it's very scary, by the way, Barry, to yeah. make up your mind like that, and I remember that yeah. fear. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so you so you pretty much did that around in the New England area, or...? Uh, yeah, you... I, I, we did. We, I traveled with different bands, but it was New England. Yeah, that's right. Boston uh, came upon Little Feet, great mm. band, uh-huh. uh, and messed around with that stuff for a while. So let's fast forward to uh, you uh, planting uh, planting your flag in the on the West Coast, and uh, mm. tell me about your your early experiences there. When I hit the West Coast, a fusion. Um, McLaughlin and Chikoria and Return to Forever was all happening. And uh, so I began, and began playing with them uh, quite a bit. Herbie Hancock played that kind of music for a while. Uh, and having done that, you know, the blues kind of left me a little bit because fusion has a tendency to do that, to, to, uh, to, to uh, you know, you leave the blues behind a little bit of fusion, although I love to play fusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends how you play it. And, um, you right. know, McLaughlin certainly includes it. And uh, and then began getting with the best jazz players out here. Now I'm playing with just exactly those people. Scooter Powell mm-hmm. uh, is one of them. Just fin- just unbelievable. I just am in heaven playing with this band. Uh-huh. Well, uh, tell me, um, did you notice a diff? Did you ever during during the time that you were playing fusion? Did you notice a difference between what? Was how how fusion expressed itself on the West Coast from what it did from the way it expressed itself on the East Coast. Yeah, on the East Coast, um, it, uh, it it was more packaged, and the West Coast was more experimental, more avant garde. Uh, you know, when, more on the, on the outside of the West Coast, and uh, the players were more varied in their style um, on the West Coast. There's a lot more creativity over here, really, frankly, in the East Coast. 
It was simpler, but it was more packaged. Those are the players I met. The players, the real players, were out here. I mean, in New York City, you know, there's always New York City had traditional good jazz players, right. and then the rest of New England. Um, uh, yeah, actually, the couple of bands I hooked up with that I really liked up there were like boogie blues bands, really fast boogie blues stuff. But the West Coast is where was where it was at then, and still is, frankly. Would you say that the, what what the way it was played on, on the West Coast probably uh, was the precursor to what smooth jazz is now, or what would you say? Uh, that's a good question. Grover, Grover, uh, you know, in my opinion, was sort of the beginning of it. And I, I actually met him in Boston, that's, so I don't know where he really was traveling a lot, uh, mm-hmm. where he was touring, but uh, wherever he was at was where it was <laughs> where it was started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and um, you, I think you, uh, at what point did you finally decide you had to, the, the chops to do the writing and, and, and arranging and what have you? Wow, man, you ask good questions. Um, I don't know that I even have them. Uh, still, you know, uh, I keep looking for looking for new stuff that uh, because I become unsatisfied with what I've got. Um, writing music that is underneath players who can let loose uh, can be fairly simply r- uh, put together. I'm actually teaching my daughter now; she's fourteen, six, augmented all sorts of chord structures and voicing. The most important part of writing is voicing. Uh, I don't know if the audience knows what that is, but it's the uh, the relationship between the notes in the chord. It's the same chord, it's just how they're arranged and how they move amongst each other. Um, so writing for, for jazz, or blues, jazz or blues players is pretty simple. Playing with them, you know, if you're a keyboard player, if that's what we're talking about here, and, and, and inspiring people to go d- different places, that's a whole different ballgame. That's, that's genius in my mind. I can't begin to do that. Well, then um, who did you initially um, hook up with when you, once you hit the West Coast? I and mean, you mentioned Scooter, but yeah. um, you know, I, at, at, what, at what point during, during the time that you, that you uh, uh, started recording or started doing more playing, you know, getting more gigs and what have you, yeah, I have to admit to you that I began uh, putting together sounds in MIDI in computers right. because uh, I I I wanted to be able to play the most commercial thing. Being honest with you, uh, to be able to get out there because as a violinist, nobody knew what this was. What do you mean the violin playing? Even rock, much less jazz or blues. There were some jazz violinists before me, but. They, they they weren't the most popular and they weren't in the mainstream. So I had a couple of three walls in front of me, and so I wanted to have a couple of it knocked down if I could, which were the structure of the tunes. I wanted to keep it simple, Hello. Right? simple and straightforward. So I wrote things on MIDI uh, as a very second rate keyboard player and kept it very simple. Uh, I and, and I was I did fairly well with that. But what what really started kicking it off was when I met a guy named Joel Gaines on a keyboard, Brian Price on guitar, uh, P. Bass Jones, and and we began to play together, you know, mm-hmm. and really make meat happen. Okay. And um, how far then? How far along before you um, met the people that are playing with you now? That takes time. Um, it was probably uh, five years that I was hanging here. Uh, because you have to prove yourself, you have to go out and play around, and uh, and and you know when they if you if you really play really well, you will go where you want to go. Uh-huh. So um, you just have to keep practicing every day, and do what you know he has to happen, and the right cats will come to you. Then, um, at what point did you get in, get involved with uh, TV and movie scoring? Um, well, it was an obvious match because I was a classical enthusiast, jazz, rock, hard rock, heavy metal. I mean, I like to like all of that stuff. Uh, um, and so when I was, I went to, I was called on to do some commercials as a commercial actor. And, uh, then, you know, I, I guess I was lucky enough to, for people to see me and want me for other stuff. So I was a principal in general hospital for a while, hmm. did a lot of commercials. Uh, and then, with my voice, I narrated, uh, I don't know, does a couple of dozen a and biographies. I narrated the, the most watched A&E biography in history, uh, Nostradamus. 
Mm-hmm. And, and with all these connections, uh, I knew that I should just apply my music to it. And I did that. And I ran and dr- wrote some film scores. And then I began a music library uh, called Spider Cues, uh, where I represent, um, I think it's 67 composers. And they all give me, give Spider Cues music, and we submit it to trailers and libraries, entire trailers and films and TV. And I, uh, I edit some of it and tell them how to do it and all that stuff. And but you know, I have a company that does that, and I just go out and play the violin. <laughs> is what I do. <laughs> well, okay. Um, are you writing for writing for other artists, or strictly yourself, or? Uh, it's strictly myself. Um, yeah, you know, if if you're a key, I'm not a keyboard player. Particularly, I can play keyboards, but I'm not really very good at it. Or guitar. I'm a violinist. So, all single instrument players, like saxophone singers, violinists. I don't think we talk about it very much. We really find ourselves at a loss for real, real cool writing of the structure of a tune that really requires your buddies, your, your keyboard players and friends to write stuff for mm-hmm. you because you're not, that's not what you do. You let loose on your instrument. Right. Uh, so I, I don't write that much uh, uh, for, for jazz or rock or whatever. Well, aside from um, the obvi- you know, what, what you've already stated about how the um, the acting made you and and narrating and doing commercials made you available for the TV and movie scoring. How would you say acting? What what would you say acting did for for you as a musician? Otherwise, artistically speaking, that's a real good question. Um, when you become a serious actor and you take the serious master classes and you just you realize that acting is really about sharing. And that, in fact, if you're doing serious plays or serious films as opposed to, let's say, TV episodes, every time you act, for me anyway, it's quite deep. It doesn't have to be. It can be a light scene, but a lot of scenes are quite deep in sharing and soul-searching. And I realize that's the same thing when you play the violin, that you play music, that sometimes it's fun and happy. It has to be light and everyone's having fun. But there's some, a lot of moments where you have to dig deep and share uh, from your soul, and uh, when you do that night after night, it, it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I, let me let me ask. Then um, you said you uh, you you were you were uh, a principal on the General, General Hospital. Hospital. Yeah. And what other what other uh, acting projects? Uh, movies of the week. Um, I think the last one I did was the Menendez Brothers. Okay. Uh, uh, movies of the week. Um, I co-starred in Mad About You a couple of times. Uh, yeah, so but I'm too busy to do all that stuff now. Uh, I get called occasionally. I just got called to possibly voice a Lexus commercial. But, mm. uh, you know, again, I'm just... I'm, my new CD uh, called Give It All is out there uh, selling and doing well and, and gathering concerts, negotiations. So, you know, that's I think I'll be coming to Missouri... Uh, right away, I hope to uh, do some concerts with this really, really good band. So that's what I do. Now, give it all uh, is your fourth CD. That's right. And let's talk about talk about the, that that evolution from yeah. the first one to the yeah, fourth. Yeah, th- it's it's very different for me. I I had a testimony to everyone around me. I was so in love with performing with this band. It's a seven piece, six piece band sometimes seven with a, with an R&B uh, uh, singer. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, and I was so in love with playing it that I, I wanted that on a CD, the live performance, the energy. And now when you go into a studio and try and do that, that's not easy, you yeah. know. So I sort of, sort of half did that as well as uh, the format of, uh, of, you know, playing stuff out. And that CD ma- joined the two together, live performance with a CD that, uh, you know, yeah. with, with, with charts that, People are following, so to speak, uh, and it just, it's just a beautiful job with that. I'm, it, it's just wonderful. I love Give It All. Who would you say was your influences or inspiration on, on as far as uh, contemporary jazz violin? Or, contemporary jazz violin. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can go back further uh, now. Yeah, I, uh, Stuff Smith, uh, Ray. Uh, Ray uh, uh, well, John Lapointe, I guess, really it was was the beginning, uh, I guess, of of large significant influence on everybody playing the violin. John Luponte uses a phase shifter. Mm -hmm. So all his sounds are going, you know, in a wow, wow, like this. So he, so he's never really settling into notes without the phase shifter. Uh, Stefan Grappelli is 
mind-blowing as a jazz player. Mm -hmm. uh, his stuff is, is kind of dotted eighth notes. No one really played the blues well stuff Miss Smith did uh, on the violin uh, what, the way I wanted to, uh, so that you're talking to people uh, and your, your left hand and your right hand are moving so that, uh, um, yeah, there's some expression there, you know. I'm, it's, I don't vibrate sometimes on the violin. In fact, I've been kicked out of orchestras before because I'm not playing classically anymore. <laughs> uh, it's a new way of playing the violin that I wanted to investigate, and I still, I'm still am. I've been doing it for for a long time, uh, so that you don't aren't playing just like fiddle or jazz fast notes, fast notes on the violin. Uh, Karen uh, Karen um, uh, Briggs plays some jazz violin now, like that, and. Uh, it's fun. It's neat to listen to, but I wanted to have some more emotion to the playing. How about uh, John Blake Jr. or Michael White or uh, yeah, King yeah, Harris? Huh? yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, as I've been saying, I just am not that big a fan of lines of of just 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 line, musical lines. They need to say something. They need to go somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, actually, I guess I, I look more towards uh, rock. And uh, and uh, and blues players for that. Uh, Jimi Hendrix actually influenced me a great deal. Okay. Um, uh, Grover did. Uh, some of the smooth jazz players do. Uh, Dave Cos does. You know, oh, uh, even you know, I'm not really their music doesn't really turn me on that much. But I, but I love their playing. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, when you get some of these guys playing live, it's way different than the radio. So. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, anybody who's, who's saying something with their instrument, John McLaughlin, of course, blows my mind. Chick Corea, all these people, Stanley. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what's in the what's in what's in the, the, the future for uh, Mr. Noah Webb as far as his career, Project, um, projects I, wise, and that type? Yeah, of thing. yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm asked to play on some films here and there, and I take them up for that. Uh, and, but besides that, uh, I, I. I am touring. I mean, I'm just looking to be on the road an awful lot, uh, which is just, you can't beat being on the road, for me, you know, playing live. Uh, and that's what I'm doing, musically. Uh, that's it. That's, I'll be doing that with Give It All and all the other tunes uh, for quite a while, I think, actually. Uh, people are actually wanting me to write some new tunes and get going with a new CD, but, you know, this is so involved to do concerts. Uh, that's what I'll be doing. And in Missouri. Okay. Okay. Well, I tell you what, uh, before we get off here, I, I mean, before, before I hang up with you, there are a couple of things I want to ask you, but they'll be off tape. Right. And, uh, but for my listeners, um, I want to definitely thank you for gracing, gracing their ears with this conversation. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing some, some, you know, some things and continued success to you, Mr. Webb. Great. Thank you, Barry. All right.